Hello and welcome to History Hacked, where we flipped everything you thought you knew about history on its head. We have a great show for you today. Scott and I are joined by Robert of the wonderful YouTube channel, Observation Deck. Robert is just a wealth of knowledge about a great many topics, and in this conversation we discuss Anatoly Fomenko's new chronology, the Tartarian Empire, lost technology, and so much more. This conversation is a meaty one, so without any further delay, let's get into it. Okay, so uh, where do you want to start, guys? Well, give us a brief couple sentences about who you are and how you got into this. Okay, so uh, a couple of years ago, I, I used to be uh, on the international talk circuit many moons ago. I've, I've rubbed shoulders with the David Ikes of the world on the same stage and, and everything else. And I decided to come out of that uh, years and years ago. I was a staff writer for a magazine that's now defunct called UFO Reality. Um, and I've done a couple of TV documentaries with TV Azteca over in um, uh, Mexico, Channel 4 here, Sky One, and all the rest of it. And it was about the UFO phenomena because my expertise was as a clinical hypnotherapist in, in psychology. Anyway, so that led to a, a life of corporate consultancy work in terms of leadership and development. And about four years ago, um, I frankly got fed up of traveling up and down the motorway, living in hotel rooms and, and doing all that bit that other people who don't think is a wonderful life, and it, it is, just is not. <laughs> so I got sick of it. I decided to take the plunge and thought, you know what, I'm going to start my own YouTube channel at 55 years old. <laughs> you know, they all thought I was crazy, but I've always had a passion for archaeology, history and all the rest of it. And so at 55, I thought, you know what, I'm going to have a career change. And it's a case of, uh, um, you know, you, you, you're either going to make it or you're not. You know, I was on quite a high level because I was one of the very few civilians that were asked to come into high security MOD compounds and train colonels, majors, and fleet admirals in communication skills, you know, so and that was a, that was a kind of like an ironic compliment, if you could, if you see what I mean. <laughs> but, you have them watch, you had them watch Dr. Strangelove. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Honestly, the room was, was scarily familiar, you know, <laughs> um, but uh, after all the consultancy work, I decided to follow the passion and, um, you know, it started with a metal detector years ago as a teenager, finding my own artifacts and, and stuff like that. And it just sort of, when you start questioning narrative, because as, as a consultant, your job is to notice the details and, and, and make sure. Well, I just applied my consultancy brain to history and thinking, hang on a minute, th th this doesn't add up. You know, you're saying this, they're saying that, which is why, I, I tend to like to boil the big questions down to the basics, like m my video on uh, Darwin. You know, rather than get into all the arguments about evolution and this, that, and the other, let's just go to the core, which, and, and it's the title of the video, which came first, man or monkey? And when you actually look at the evidence, man predates monkey by over 300,000 years. Darwin, you're slam dunked. You don't have to prove anything else. You know, there are artifacts that are logged and registered that date Homo sapien jawbones and, and, and other, uh, other uh, information way beyond the Darwin theory because they predate primates. I mean, primates have been around for about 300,000 years, according to the Smithsonian Institute. Well, we've got jawbones from Homo sapiens over a million years old. Yeah, yeah. Explain that, Darwin. <laughs> you know, so, so to me, I just go to the core of the question and go, look, let's just, here's the evidence, guys. Who's, who's, who's right? This is a complete contradiction. Because I think we get wrapped up too much in the minutiae of the detail. And then it just filters stuff. It gets confusing. And then all of a sudden, you know, your head explodes when you say, no, 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 no. Let's just go back to basics and, and, and ask the basic question. You know, which of these two evidence is, is older? This, this monkey, which we're supposed to have come from, or this jawbone. Well, it's the jawbone. Well, then your monkey theory is out the window. For me, it's a pragmatic approach. And, and uh, so imposing that sort of connecting the dots. And I, I also think that because I'm not directly attached to academia, and, and the same with other creators and, 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 and researchers, I suppose, is we're not worried about tenure. <laughs> So, you know, we don't have to worry that I'm not going to get paid next week because the chances are I'm not getting paid next week anyway. 
So there's a different mindset when it comes to exploring information because, and, and also we can jump like a polymath from one subject to another rather than restrict ourselves to a speciality. So it allows more dot connections because the way that the, the system is set up at the moment, yes, of course, it makes you an expert in your field, but it keeps you in your field. It doesn't look at the holistic, everything's exactly. connected. Exactly. Right? You know, you can stand in the field, but you're not allowed to travel around the farm. Exactly. Because they're, they're not your areas of expertise. So we get situations like, for instance, um, in Egyptology, where you've got Egyptologists who effectively have specialized in moving sand because there's actually nothing else to Egyptology apart. I mean, what other country in the world? Do you have Americaology? Do we have Britainology? So they've just picked the name on a map and go, we'll call that an ology. I mean, how unscientific is it? I mean, if it's anything, it's Babylonian anyway, because that was the same period of time they were built. Mm. But the point being is that we, we, because you've got these sort of uh, carpentmentalized skills or knowledge sets, you've now got Egyptologists telling climatologists they're wrong. You've, you've got Egyptologists telling geologists, like the weathering of the Sphinx and all right, mm. they're wrong. Yeah. Was well, hang on a second. Are you familiar with the, the, the art and profession of geology? No, we're Egyptologists. Then you, why have you got an opinion on it? And why should anybody listen to that opinion? Yes. You, know, you, you read hieroglyphs and then you just tick little boxes to say which dynasty that you created in the first place that goes into to match your biblical history. Now, that's, that's what you do. You know, nothing is allowed outside of that you know, and, and, and then you're questioning the geological evidence, the scientific evidence in favor of your belief. So we've, we, we've gone from science to faith, faith-based history, which is what Fomenko is all about as well. It's, you know, the whole of history is based on a faith-based system and, and, and designed to support it. So that's where I'm coming from. I just like to drop little sort of truth bombs in there into my videos and just leave them with the questions. Mm. And if someone says, well, I don't believe that. I said, well, that's your choice. I'm just asking whether you do or not. There's the evidence you decide, you know, and, and I think it's that neutrality that uh, at least my viewers tend to like, because it's, yeah. it's like, I'm not trying to push an agenda on anybody. I don't have some kind of, secret agenda to join my cult and all that kind of stuff. It's like, here's the evidence that you weren't taught in school. Now you can make your own mind up. You know, whether that be the mythological giants or uh, Egyptian artifacts found in the Grand Canyon that's been covered up by the Smithsonian or, mm -hmm. or any of these types of things. It's like, look, here's all the evidence that you're not normally allowed or will normally find or see now you're a little bit more informed about it. And I think, you know, everyone's entitled to an opinion, but you've got to make sure that you separate your opinion from the facts that you've laid out because people could come to any number of conclusions. You know, this is my, my last week's upload was actually, it, it took me 20 minutes because it just popped into my head as I was reading an old book. Um, in fact, it was um, this one, Pyramidology. Ah. <laughs> and, um, I was just flicking through the pages. I wasn't looking at anything particular. And just for some strange reason, um, one little fact popped out. And this is where your dots start connecting because you're not restricted to different professions. And it just said that the average, or sorry, that the constant temperature in the Great Pyramid is 68 degrees. Then it went on to say something else. And my, my brain just went, hang on, why 68? Why not another yeah. temperature? If you had that kind of skill, why did you pick that number? You know, and as it turns out, 68 degrees, if you think about it, because of all the, the connections in Egypt with like the snake heads, the cult of the cobra, and, and even going back as far as Sumerian, Babylonian, Egyptian, Chinese, they've all got lizard-like yeah. intelligent beings in their history. Well, 68 degrees is the perfect temperature for ectotherms, just happens to be. And ectotherms are the lizard family and the snake family. That's interesting. You know, so it's just another way, I, and I'm not saying that's why that is 68 degrees. I'm just pointing out these things are most comfortable at 68 degrees. 
if you were at 68 degrees, you would feel cold, <laughs> you know, because that's a cold blooded creature temp operating temperature. Mm -hmm. And then when you couple that with references of lizards and reptilian type deities in the same culture, you, you got to start asking questions. Why? Yeah. Every, every Why? culture. Yeah. <laughs> South it, America, it, Hindu, the, the Nagas, the everything. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, you know, there are clues that people have probably overlooked before. I mean, I've, you know, only, I have no idea why I stopped on 68 degrees and asked that, that question. But as it turned out, it was an interesting one because, you know, if you look at the ectotherms and all the rest of it, now that created a hell of a debate because there was other people saying, I about the World Health Authority said 68 is the perfect for a human to sleep and, and all the rest of it. Well, it might be, but it doesn't take away from the fact that it's ectotherm. Yeah. You know, it may be a lot of other things too, but it just, it's, is it a coincidence that the whole of that, that historical accounts and carving has got this kind of reptilian inference all the way through it in many cultures. Mm. And that just happens to be the same one. Cause I, in fact, I asked the question, uh, I didn't do it myself. It, was, it would take too long, but um, I asked the question, wouldn't it be interesting if we could get readings mm. from other pyramids and other sites and find out what the internal constant temperature is? Cause if it's 68 across the board, we're looking at a completely different history. These so-called unconnected things, according to established archaeology, are now connected by 68 degrees. And how is that possible if we were all scattered? Exactly, exactly. So, so there, for me, there are many different ways to, to tease out further strands of history and use clues that are not that obvious to start with. And yet when you start teasing it away, I mean, God, stopping at 68 degrees in the king's chamber could lead i'm not saying it will but could lead to if you could tick off any other sites china south america or, or wherever and it just happens to be within one or two degrees of the same thing you have a pattern yeah well so good luck getting in those chinese pyramids well oh man <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they let the Chinese get in there. But yeah, the Great White Pyramid. yeah, I mean, I've been, I, I've been to the Great Pyramid. I've had the pleasure of climbing up and back down the Pyramid of the Sun in Teotihuacan mm. and, and the Pyramid of the Moon and the layouts and everything else. It's just astounding to think you, you call these people primitive, but you right. can't duplicate their engineering. I mean, yeah. how arrogant is that? <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah, they were primitive people. Can you build that? No. It's well, well, explain what you mean by primitive then. Ah, they didn't have a mobile phone. <laughs> <laughs> that's usually that's usually what the the millennials, you know, the the, uh, the, the no, they don't have TVs. They don't have mobile. Phone. That's not progress. Yeah. You know, that's just you know. Anyway, guys, sorry. I know I tend to talk too much. On the same line, Robert. There's all this evidence that our history is not what it seems to be, no matter what it is. There's some people up there that, that know the truth. Why do you think the rest of us aren't allowed? Why is this information not given to us? Why is it? Why are we told this lie? Oh, that's the, the, the why. That's a $64 million. Okay. <laughs> I've been asking that one. I mean, that's the question is, because I think your, one of your questions was, um, you know, why are people resistant to Fomenko? I mean, what are the implications of his discovery? I mean, that, that, I guess that's... Yeah, but he's um, to continue. We know that he's continuing Morisov, and even you know before that, um, well, for, even I back mean, Isaac Newton. So, yeah, I mean, he, I mean, yeah, he, Fomenko certainly wasn't the first person to suggest this. I mean, there were there were scholars that came before him, including Newton, and the the, the point being is that people don't get to hear about that. But when people say, you know, when you ask. Why is there so much um, resistance to Fomenko's new chronology? I personally think that's the wrong question. It's like, no, no, no. Why is there no resistance to the current chronology? Because if they only knew that it was written by a 15th century monk who simply had three religious pivot points, which was the flood, the creation, and the birth of Christ, and everything else was fit around that, on a, a conclave of theologians, nobody outside the church got to say what our modern chronology is. 
And then that was laid down and then all the details added as we go through time. And yet, and, and so that's the history, the, the chronology that we are given, okay, as in the classrooms and educated. And yet you've got people who are questioning a mathematician, a polymath, one who's respected by institutes all over the world based on maths and astronomy. And they're going, no, we, we don't accept that. Well, you've got faith on one side, you've got science on the other. And I think the problem is a majority of the population don't know they're actually following a faith-based chronology. Because it's, you know, I mean, it's one thing for people to turn around and say, well, we, um, the Bible was written by man, you know, it's either the word of God or written by man. And no one actually figured out that, hey, guys, if you think the Bible was written by man, you just wait to see that the rest of the history was built around that book. Because everything from that point onwards then was to prove the power of Christianity. Because prior to that, one could only assume that any religious factions were fragmented and they had to do something to pull them all together. You know, and, 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 and the Dark Ages are nothing more than what, look, we can't hide everything. So we'll just call that the Dark Ages and delete it. And we'll start afresh here. Because if you think about it, that it, it's also in the linguistics. Our history is in the language. And if you're going to call something the Dark Ages, you've already labeled it as something negative, lower than normal, mm -hmm. a, a bunch of savages and all the rest of it. That's the impression that before the church came along, humanity was. We want to put you in the Dark Ages, in the caves and all the rest of it. And then the light of... Yeah, they could be the, the savior. The we'll, savior we'll of humanity. Say, yeah, and history then reboots, as it were. You know, so... And that's the chronology we're following at the moment. And yet people will question the mathematical side of the chronology that's been given to them. And, and I think it's, 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 it is a, a, a form, it is a brainwashing system because, you know, we, it is so powerful that we've all been brought up with the history that we've been given through our, through our education system. And then when we're given something that clearly questions that narrative, we're going to suffer from cognitive dissonance. Even though we've got the evidence in front of us, we, it, our belief system is so ingrained, we can't fathom that. You know, we can't see the truth no more because of our chronology than the native Indians saw the ships of the conquistadors. All we can see is the wake. This is where history is supposed to be. But what it is, we have no idea because of this manipulation. And I'm sure that, you know, um, the church is not the only uh, caste, if want of a better phrase. It's not only the caste of civilization or society that has manipulated history. You know, you've, you've got the financial sectors, the economics, you've got the church, the religions, you've got scientific, you've got the politics and you've got the military. They all have their own stories and every civilization is made up of those five castes. The problems start in history when two or more of those castes get in bed together. Like say for instance, religion and military, you know, mm. uh, uh, science and military can be a real disaster as well as oh, we've seen. In yes. So, you know, and as long as these castes maintain balance, fine. But the moment they start using their political will, I mean, let's face it, it, it in, in the Middle Ages, the church was literally faith, military and science. It, it had the monopoly on all knowledge. So if it was the fountain of all truth, just imagine how much power they could wield by writing their own narrative. And it's not like they haven't been caught being fraudulent in the past, right? The, the church is <laughs> the history of, of forgery <laughs> and, and fakeness. Exactly. Time and time again. I mean, the thing is that one of the first questions you guys asked was, um, I think it was, why should people care about the past? Well, it's, I mean, you know, it sounds like a, a throwaway question, but actually it's a critical question. Because at the end of the day, if you, if you took the micro to the macro or the as above, so below, well, we as individuals, we learn as we go through life. We go through the education system. I use the term loosely, but we go through the education system and we learn personal from personal and educational mistakes that we make. So as human beings, we grow and we evolve. But in order to do that, we must know our own history, the lessons that we've learned. Now, if you, if you then times that by 10,000 people, each one of those individual histories 
becomes the cultural history. It becomes the civilization. So without the accumulative history of all the individuals coming together and coalescing to make a civilization, as it were, then, you know, it, it, you're not going to evolve as a civilization. Because I think the, the, the thing I wrote here is history is a reflection of all the lives that have created it for themselves. And, it's, and history is the compass by which we as human beings travel by and by which civilizations evolve. You know, because without history, I mean, the bottom line is without history, how can we tell how far we've come or how far we've fallen? What direction we're going, exactly. Exactly. So it, 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 that's why I'm, I guess I'm so passionate about it because how can I possibly, um, I personally think that if we, we choose to ignore history, then the future, the present and the future is going to be something controlled outside of us completely and we do that at our peril. We, we, we really do. And I think if we begin to realize that history, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say history is a lie because nobody knows which parts of history. That's just a, a too much of a generalized statement. But we know history has been manipulated over and over again and things hidden. You know, even in modern times, this, this is not this is not resigned to history. You know, we get conflicting reports about battle zones in the Middle East. We, you know, we get one side story and then we get the other side story, you know, in Iran at the moment and all the rest of it. So none of what we're talking about history is new. I mean, you ask the questions about the things like the burning of the Library of Alexandra. Well, I called that the, the, uh, the first false flag in history mm. be be because they emptied the damn place first, you know, and then they burnt it, but they're not going to destroy something that would give them knowledge and power. That would just be ridiculous. So the best thing to do is empty the whole lot out first and run away. If you do a little bit more research, guys, you might figure out that before the empty, uh, before the Library of Alexander went up, there are rumors going about that uh, Peter the Great got hold of it. And it is now still, to this day, most of those books somewhere under the labyrinth of the Kremlin. Ah. That's as far as I got. You know, and then from that point onwards, I thought the Kremlin might get a little bit miffed if I started poking around the sewers underneath the Kremlin just to find um, uh, Peter the Great's. Because Peter the Great ended up apparently with a very large portion of that library and a very large percent. And get this, <laughs> then it was ferried or a portion of that was ferried by the Roman Catholics to Rome. Yeah. So here we are, and we end up back in the Vatican archives. And that's the connection with the Romanovs in terms of their yeah, rise. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's like Orwell said, you know, if you control the narrative, if you control the past, you control the present. If you control the present, you control the future. So, and that's, that's been standard art of war practice for every nation since the dawn of mankind. You know, even you, we, we don't have to go that far back to find out, to, to, to see people burning books in the street you know, because they disagree with the contents. Uh, and, and the digital version of that now is shadow banning, not finding the, 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 the right information that's alternative to the grand mm. narrative. You see, before book burning was obvious, you could see the flames and feel the heat. Now they just have to press a delete button. And it's gone before you even realize it. And, and for me, that's the dangerous part. It's sinister. You, know? you, don't, you don't know that it was burnt. No, yeah. no, absolutely not. And that's, again, why, I mean, you know, the biggest oracle, the modern digital oracle in the world being Google, you know, uh, it, they are in one of the strongest positions of any uh, corporation in the history of mankind, because they get to say what's real. You know, they get to say who speaks. I mean, it might not look like that, but you, you, you do a search criteria in google then you do it in say uh, i don't know like swiss cows or duck duck go or something go. you will get totally different uh you know if if, if the system was fair mm -hmm. you have repeating things you, you know they would like they would mirror each other but clearly yeah. you can see that, that the priorities are totally different so we've already got that censorship you know what what do you think happens? I mean, I know we just let's see. Let's just talk about the Tartarians because that's kind of a a thing that's a recurring topic. I think this idea that there was this empire that mm. was vast. It was 
essentially a federation that give me your take on Tartaria um, and could they have been survivors of a much older civilization? Touch on that a bit. I think the, yeah, uh, Tartaria or the, the, the Tartar Empire. Uh, I mean, you can, you know, you can't deny the fact that, that they existed because you've only got to look at the maps and the maps dating or spanning not only a vast period of time, but when you look at the sheer size of this empire, why has no one ever been educated on the, on the size of this with the, the, the double-headed eagles? Um, did they have advanced technology? Well, if you couple that with the design of some of the buildings that you can clearly see around that period, you can actually see them scattered from China to the Americas. And it's like the pyramids, you know, if you've got such a similar structure all over the place, you know, intercontinental, isn't that the link on its own that you're denying is there? And it's the same with the design of Tartarian Empire. I, I, I mean, if you look at a lot of the design, because this also brings in the idea of star forts, obviously. You know, mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm also a believer in the shape of the space can create a particular type of frequency. The cymatics, it's the... The, the cymatics, and yes. it works in every single you see because you've got two sides to cymatics you can put a frequency through create a lovely shape or you can create a shape and then you can record the frequency you can go the other way and so some of these these structures had their own cymatic resonance um for whatever reasons i well, think they had a much more advanced technology not based on circuits that we recognized but on a more natural uh, ability with nature itself to utilize frequencies and energies that we simply can't see so therefore they don't exist you know um so you, you're, think, robert you're talking about pulling frequency out of the ground and out of the air yes right? absolutely yeah. which isn't so crazy when you think tesla did it anyway exactly you know and was stopped by western house because we couldn't meter it and one thing, one of the questions that I did pose about the Tartarian Empire and this energy frequency was, if you look at the map and then you track back where Tesla was born, I asked the question is, did Tesla actually have hold of a Tartarian textbook? Because he lived in southern yeah, Tartarian. Hungarian, yeah. Yeah, Hungarian. So, so, and I'm thinking, hang on a second. So did he have access to what was left of some knowledge that we no longer have access to? And he just simply went over to the States and carried on doing his thing. And was crushed for it. <laughs> it yeah, crushed. absolutely. Yeah. Because, yeah, but because the new chronology was already established. You know, if, if every single discovery that we've made in our modern history books has a connection with the church. The question is, if we were a truly independent civilization, why does everything have to revolve around a book written in the third century by a bunch of Roman monks? And yet we do, and we accept it as a civilization. And, it, it, and, and so when people ask me, you know, um, you know, why do you believe in such outlandish stuff? And just, it, the, the reply is, you need to take a closer look at what you believe in at the moment, because you... I don't understand at what age people stop asking questions or at what age now, is it younger when we start losing our curiosity about life and the universe, you know, and it's a shame because we have an inquisitive mind by nature. And my hope is that some people wake up soon enough to realize that if they covered up through the new chronology, the history that we actually have, what is it that they actually covered up and what potential does the human race have if we had access to the true history of mankind and how far back would that access go you know yeah, it's almost like if we had a if we had a glimpse of how great we could be yeah uh that that's the kind of the roadblock right now is people are I think especially in this type of space, it, it gets painted into a conspiracy or it goes into, you know, flat earth and blah, blah, blah. And, and there's all these red herrings when what we're saying yeah. is, look, the, the evidence is right in front of us, guys. And Fomenko came along and said, look, I'm going to break down all these chronicles. I'm going to approach this from a, he's going to reunite chronology with math, with it used to, yes. I mean, it used to be part of math, right? And uh, yeah, that's, it, it, and that's it, the amazing part is like, it actually was a subset of, of 
mathematics and now and and then unfortunately he's russian which i i I was thinking this morning i'm like god imagine if he was italian or if he was any other because there's this russophobia is so ridiculous right now that you know (laughs) why do we have to be on the defense of truth I think we should flip that around. And I think, I think it's important to ask who created the chronology we currently accept. Since no one seems to question to this any degree or write off Fomenko's calculations and results as comparisons to what they think they know rather than what they actually know. You know and they have, they have a skepticism, obviously, towards anything that's different. But I wondered when they, if they applied that same skepticism to what they already think they know, what results that they would come out with. Because I would suspect that many people are unaware of Scaliger's role, Joseph Scaliger's role, in the chronology that everybody's following. Mm-hmm. And for those of people who have not, you know, the 15th to 16th century, chronology was the study of calendars, in case your viewers don't know. But, the, you know, the study of calendars. Um, but the, the, as I said earlier, the theologians only debated three things, which was the creation, the flood, and the crucifixion. Everything had to fit around those three pivotal points. This is the Scaliger chronology that the whole of our history is now, around three pivotal religious points. That is not science. It's simply the musings of, of, of uh, a 15th century monk that wanted to persuade the rest of the world that his view of history was the correct one. And we've been basing our our academic and classroom history around that since that point in time. And and, and people don't realize that Scaliger single-handedly have told the rest of us from that point onwards what our history is. Now the question, you know, and I think the the more people realize where the existing chronology come from, the more they might start to question that and then look for alternatives. But I, I mean, you can't blame them because, you know, very few people get the time to go and research that kind of stuff. So the system itself is set up where we keep you so busy, you don't have time to think about stuff because you're too busy getting your gear ready for going back to work Monday morning and the kids and, and, and so on and so forth. You know, life. But life shouldn't, I, I believe, life shouldn't be that busy. We should have time to mentally breathe and consider who who we are, where we're going, what the potential we have that we've got. And we can only do that if we've got the correct information about where we've been, where we've come from and, and our own history. And if that's falsified, where do we start? You know, if you consider Fomenko to be correct, our whole civilization is a lie. And this would undoubtedly probably be the greatest lie ever told. I, I can't think of absolutely anything that would be greater than this in history. And, and that's even, that's including the moon landings. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry guys, I had to get that one. Out. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, that kind of brings me to this point. Whenever we discuss this with somebody who hasn't heard of it, uh, one of the pushbacks is that this, this revisioning that we're, we're proposing is too big. It's like they, they couldn't have lied that big, but there's, yeah. there's no cap to the size of the lies they could tell as far as what they could get away with. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, 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 but this is why I think if you're going to introduce Fomenko to anybody, especially the skeptic, obviously, yeah. let's just take the skeptic, then to introduce Fomenko straight off the bat, I think would be a mistake. I, I think the first step would be get, to get them to question their existing belief structure and then introduce Fomenko when they start questioning that as a possibility or an alternative. And then you'd be able to sit there logically and say, okay, so what evidence do we have for our current chronology? And what evidence do we have for the new one being proposed? And if you give, you've got to move people from, you know, they're taught through their left, but they're fixed in their right brain. Mm. And you need to get into the right brain. And so this is why I said earlier about we need to step into their world so we can talk about the current chronology first. That's, that's got to be a must. So we've, we've got some familiarity and rapport on how we see the world. And then rather than just lay this bombshell on them, it would be a case of uh, being a little bit more gentle and saying, oh, have you seen this? Or introduce mm-hmm. ideas to this. 
I think the education system and the way we live is designed that over a period of time, it solidifies this unconscious bias that we have on, on, on many, many things. And because it's unconscious, you know, it, that's what feeds the cognitive dissonances. I don't care how much information you're giving me. I'm sticking to what I know is safe and it's true and I don't like change. Because if I have to admit to myself that Fomenko could be right, then I would also have to admit everything I know and have been told is a lie. That's a huge thing. And that's not just within your own government's education system. That's religion across the world. It's like a cultural humility. Like a, it's humility yeah. on a cultural level, like on a, it, a collective, exactly. collective mm -hmm. humility. And, and, it, and if it's, um, I mean, I've also been thinking about just this tool that we're using right now, as much as it's in the ether and it can be manipulated by, you know, I mean, where you talk about Google and how dangerous that kind of centralization of information, you know, I think yeah. about all the data that we have, if it gets lost, I mean, you know, you lose data and it's gone forever. Um, but it's also this tool might be the one thing that can possibly allow us to share with each other and allow us to maybe on a global a sense send or something, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's a dual yeah, I, sword. It's a double, it, it is, it, it is a double edged sword. And, um, I mean, on the one hand, clearly we, in, in our modern times, we've got information manipulation, fake news, call it what you like. And it's not just mainstream media and then it's, it's, it's coming from everywhere. You know, it, it, you, you can't really, I mean, obviously you can, you can level certain accusations at the mainstream media because they've got the biggest clout on, on the internet in terms of, of getting information out there. But at the same time, there are still thousands of websites and sources out there that, that, that pump out rubbish every single day. So you've got that to contend with. And then amongst all of that, you've got to try and tease out uh, those little strands of truth or clues. And it, 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 so while on the one hand it says, yeah, we can communicate with everybody. On the other hand, it, it's created this quagmire of just rubbish and dross that we've got to get through in order to get to some kind of semblance of, of truth somewhere, you know, and, and uh, I think nothing's actually changed in history. We might turn around and say, Oh, well, we've got the internet, we've got global communication. And the, the only thing that's actually changed between the, 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 the fake history that we've been given and, and the, and the creation of it and the present day is just two things basically is uh, the, the mode of distribution, the media in which is used, and the, um, the amount of reach you have. Today we have emails. They had missionaries. It was a slow process, but the principles were exactly the same. So the only thing that's changed is we've just got more efficient at lying to people. You know? Yeah. <laughs> because the tools are better. But the intentions of the use of those tools, I, I don't think has changed much at all over time. You know, be, even if, it, you know, back in the back in the days of the Roman Empire, you know, they used to stamp the the uh, the victory arch on the back of some of the coins. And that was there. Uh, in case you didn't know, guys, coins, especially the back of coins were especially in the Roman Empire, at least were used as newspapers. Hmm. So so if you were going to the outer reaches of the empire and all of a sudden a, a new Cistercius from Julius Caesar pops up with a different back on it, just like we do with our coinage of commemoration. It might have a, a victory arch on there to let the person know out in the outreaches that we just took Paris because it will have that and that would be the news. So, like, hey, look, victory arch, Paris, we've got them. You know, empires expanded. So they were also like mini newspapers or emails as well as, yeah. as the currency. You know, so there was information contained with on it. It wasn't it wasn't just for, for for ceremonial purposes, as it were. But so I think the Internet is a great tool, but it could also be the biggest problem. I mean, obviously, I did the History Gate episode, which was Flamenco anyway. But within yes. that episode, I think I also included Pompeii. Yes. Just, and we're, just we definitely up, want to talk about Pompeii. Yeah. Just to yeah. back up Flamenco saying, look, here's an example of what we've been told. And, and the evidence we have, you know, so when you start quoting, you know, fruits, maps, um, you know, uh, you've got monuments, 
And there's all the evidence there to say 1647, 1647, 60. What are we doing in 79 AD saying it's wiped out? What are we doing looking at maps of the 13th, 14th and 15th century after authorities say Pompeii was wiped off the map and wasn't rediscovered until 18 such as that? Well, the, clearly the map makers knew where it was. You know, so that for me is like, well, guys, it's a blatant lie. And you've been caught out with logical, rational evidence and the narrative will still stay the way it is. As far as I'm concerned, I don't understand why people don't care about it because if you take that single example mm -hmm. then you have to ask yourself well what else yeah you know i visited the temple in uh, of hetnushat in in egypt okay so she was one of the supposedly greatest egyptian empresses and her temple is absolutely huge and i'm there taking these photographs this is about four years four five years ago and when i got them back only for one reason though when you look at the same photograph, because I got the right angle, when you look at the same photographs in the 1930s, it was just a mountain. There was nothing. It was a pile of rocks. Right. They have literally built the whole complex because none of it was there. I've, I've actually got the same angle. They've built the whole complex since then because they're creating, I mean, these, these are historical Disneylands. Good, good point. I was just going to say it's an amusement park. It, it, exactly. It's a different type of amusement park, but one nonetheless. And they maintain the narrative of a history that in, in, in a lot of cases simply didn't happen. It's similar with the Great Wall in China, too. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Oh, do you know this, the Marco Polo? Because someone actually commented on my channel the other, the other week and said, uh, oh, you should read the, the travels of Marco Polo. And I said, I would. It's just that he didn't go anywhere. No. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, um, you know no, no mention of anything in the cities, the language, no, the, uh, the, the the writing, the wall. Exactly. The and 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 as I pointed out to this guy, I said, look, the Chinese kept fastidious accounts of diplomatic visits. He was of the stature within his society to be classed as a diplomat, and there's absolutely no record, even in the Chinese side of things, that this guy ever turned up. You know, so. Uh, who who can tell what part of history is actually the truth or if anything at all you know and and that's the problem is that when you start peeling the layers away you know it's the same with when i spoke about um ancient concrete and geopolymers you know and and they call it um disquamentation or uh, which is the peeling of the rock like you were which like if you got sunburned your yeah. skin would peel yeah right now you can't get that on solid, normal rock that comes out of the ground because it's, it's just the rock. Its skin doesn't peel, it's igneous rock for Christ's sake. You'd have to smash it with a hammer. So it doesn't, the skin of a rock doesn't peel over time. That's a sign that it's concrete. Yeah. Because concrete will blow and, and what we call disquamate over time. Now when you put a microscope on all these so-called ancient artifacts and huge monoliths, they're all skin peeling which clearly indicates geopolymer and not the fact that we drag 75 tons of rocks over 350 kilometers up to the Great Pyramid of Giza. No, you didn't. You concreted the materials on site. You might have cut them from the quarries and all the rest of it, but you sure as hell didn't bring these, these blocks up. On both. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and for me, again, from the, from the Egyptian point of view, and t the stonework, at the base of the Great Pyramid is more Peruvian than it is Egyptian. And those little, those little knobs that come out. Yeah. And if you start looking around the, the Giza complex rather than just the Great Pyramid, you will see that the connection with Peru, the, the style of architecture, and Egypt, it's it's identical. But they never show you that on 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 the documentaries or anything like that because the, well, the Egyptologists don't like that stuff coming up even though you know when you've got that cut where three you know stones are into to, to time with it, it's like oh no 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 we, we don't show that we'll just just show them the, the shot of the pyramid because if it gets too I mean if you think about it if you look at the joints of the skilled workers in Peru and they say oh you can't get a, a cigarette paper through that joint all right now and we go wow well 
go into the Great Pyramid and see if you can do the same thing, because it's the same joint. There's no mortar in that joint, but you still can't get a cigarette paper. So th these people had a common base of knowledge in terms of skill and masonry and architecture. Mm -hmm. And yet it's, it's still denied for whatever reason. So, so do you feel like, uh, I mean, according to Fomenko, that he, he feel, he, he's leading us to believe that the pyramids were essentially a burial ground for the, the cons. What is your take on the, on the pyramids in terms of, do you believe in that they were, the Egyptians basically came, up, that they were there before the Egyptians or what we yeah. know as Egyptians? Okay. Um, the, the, there's, a, there's a few observations that I've made over time in terms of, and, and I'm sure other people have done the same thing. For, uh, number one, um, for, for the Egyptians, if we, if we stick to the traditional narrative as far as Egyptology is concerned, then we have to ignore the fact that this particular uh, structure, the Great Pyramid with the King's Chamber and the Coffer, this structure goes against all dynastic traditions of previous Egyptology and all traditions afterwards, because think about it, guys, the, the, the coffer, or shall we say the, the king's tomb, is above ground. Nowhere else in, in Egypt does that take place. Everybody's buried below ground level, except this one. Secondly, every single burial tomb without question is covered in cartouches and hieroglyphs. And there is not a single one in the Great Pyramid. It's blank, save from a Roman graffiti or two or, or something like that, but it's blank. If you, would, if you were Egyptian, given their, shall we say, national pride in their history, you, if you'd have built that kind of structure, you'd want to sign it, you know, because like, hey, that's, that's my work, that's brilliant, okay? I'm gonna sign that, but there is no signature. And the other point is that um, you've got air shafts in the King's Chamber anyway. Dead people don't need to breathe. So c clearly, I don't think it was even designed for what we've been told. And number one, the only reason we call it a King's Chamber is because it's been named a chamber for the King. All right, as far as I'm concerned, it's the chamber in the middle of a, a pyramidical structure that we have yet to figure out what its use was for. This is the cool 68 degrees, you know. But then when you start looking at the maths contained within just the chamber, I mean, forget the, the pyramid itself, but when you look at the maths contained within the chamber, the coffer alone, um, in case, you know, people don't realize, is that the four sides and the base of the coffer match exactly the volume that was taken out to form the whole. You know, it's the same mass volume. If you, if you um, put a line between the bottom corner, internal corner of the coffer on one side up to the other one, it also gives you 51.51 degrees, which is the slope angle of the pyramid on the outside. If you measure the king's chamber from one end to the other, it gives you the exact measurement in pyramid inches as it does for the founding father's silver dollar. Hmm. If you measure it from width ways, it gives you the founding father's half dollar. If you measure it halfway, it gives you the founding father's quarter dollar. If you just step back and look at the whole pyramid from it, it gives you the Illuminati on top of your dollar. You see? So the, the note reference that we talk about, you know, the Illuminati on, on, on the top of the door, the all seeing eye, mm -hmm. the eye of Sauron and all the rest of it, um, that's the obvious connection where the conspiracy theorists go Illuminati and all, all, all the rest of it. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not really interested in that aspect of, 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 of history because you, you, you could argue forever and a day, you wouldn't be able to prove a damn yes. thing anyway. I, I want facts. So, so notwithstanding secret societies sitting on top of a, a, a dollar bill, you've got to ask, I found it more than a coincidence that the measurements within the chamber with with the the idea of the all seeing eye on top of the bill what is it that the measurements in the chamber match the rest of the currency that's interesting isn't it <laughs> because if it was just one i could think okay that's lucky shot but then when you measure the width and you go hang on a second that's the same hang on a minute let me just do okay come on there has got to be a some kind of connection between these dimensions that we've got here now and that, that all seeing eye thing, 
with with how would they know what the weight of, of of a currency not in existence for thousands of years to come was going to be so the other explanation would be well it, they didn't they clearly didn't that doesn't make sense but what does make sense is there are a lot of people in places of influence that have encoded or decoded this knowledge and have run civilization based upon whatever's encoded into the great pyramid you know including the economy based on the measurements of the king's chamber for what reason i have no idea you know but it doesn't negate the fact that the connection's there mm. you know so for for me um when people talk about the hall of records and all that kind of stuff to me the great pyramid is the hall of records you know you're kind of it's right in front of your face guys you just haven't picked the right language to decode it with because at the end of the day i mean i think i quoted this on on my last friday's video when i said look guys let me put it this way they built the great pyramid thousands of years ago and put it there thousands of years later we sent voyager out with the message from our planet now it's not their fault the pyramid builders that we're too dumb to read the record still you know because the library has been sitting there for 10,000 years and you haven't figured out how to turn the page you know but perhaps when you do you're ready for the next chapter now i i think some people way back in history using that kind of analogy had turned the page had figured it out and then closed the book for everybody else because it allowed them advantage and power over others and to me knowledge is power and they're going to hang on to it which is why if you go back to alexandria come on guys do you honestly believe they burnt all those books that's power you know they're just going to put a, a fake a false a historical false flag and the library of alexander goes down and babylon and all the rest of it but it's all shimmied away and yet our, our current population or the complaints from the alternative views and the conspiracy theories, they actually think we live in an age where all this is new, you know, and it's only applicable in our age. And yet it, it's been going on for thousands of years in one form or another. We're just better at it now because we've got technology to help us communicate. But the intention has never changed, you know, to maintain the status quo. Well, Robert, we really appreciate this, um, your time. And we do value what you do. We, we love that channel. Uh, since we've been going into Famanco, it's, it's really hard finding people that could speak as well as yourself to talk about this. I, I, I think when you got, I know exactly what you mean, because having spent 10 years in corporate leadership, my mm -hmm. job was to stand up in front of them and present information as a corporate trainer. So, you know, and I've given talks all over the place. So taking someone like Famenko, I mean, believe me, I don't think the viewers appreciate that you have to read an awful lot and then you boil it back down to something that they, they can digest. Exactly. They go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about, you know. And, and, but it's the same with every subject, though. You know, if, if, mm. if you're, you're either going to overcomplicate it or you're going to rant like a lunatic in their basement and no one's going to listen to you, or you can find that middle ground and, and, and not only have a, uh, have someone listen to what you're saying because it's logical but they're not going to think you're a bunch of crazy lunatics and and at the end of the day whether it be history or any other subject i think if you're going to tell people about it for the very first time then you need to be gentle with them to start with <laughs> <laughs> all right thank cheers you. thank you so much all right, take care bye-bye bye -bye. i just want to thank everyone for checking that out i hope you all enjoyed it once again, give Robert a follow at youtube.com slash observation deck and check out all of his amazing videos he's put out over the years. And of course, if you enjoyed this video, give us a like, subscribe, and let us know what you think down in the comments. And also check out historyhack.com for more mind-shattering videos and articles. Take care.